Well, uh, thank you. I've enjoyed the uh, meeting so far. Uh, I think this is an exciting time to evolve uh, in vitro systems into more powerful platforms. Well, today I'm going to be talking about the three-dimensional liver platforms for predicting toxicity, and I added, and efficacy uh, in humans. So the outline of what I'll describe today, I'll give a short introduction and background. I'll talk about the role of quantitative systems pharmacology in the application of microphysiology systems, the status of our liver MPS, and then what we think is critically important, the development of the microphysiology database, and then challenges being addressed for the future. So uh, this uh, picture kind of describes the challenge we have in understanding uh, biological systems. How does the complete uh, uh, system work and what can go wrong? Uh, we have to understand what the parts are, but we can't study the parts and understand how the car runs, and you can't run the car and understand those parts that can go wrong. And in fact, this uh, reflects on the hermeneutic rule where we must understand the whole in terms of the detail and the detail in terms of the whole. And I think this is very important as we evolve these systems. Uh, well, this is the hermeneutic rule in biology. Uh, let's see if I can. I need help if I'm going to point. Ah, I don't, I won't point. We don't have time. I'll, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so obviously you can start on the top of this circle and have a whole organism. Uh, you have the organs down to cells, networks within cells, individual molecules, obviously the genome, and then engineered molecules to either manipulate or measure activities. Uh, and of course, uh, going back a number of years, we can start controlling biology. Uh, then that's led to organotypic constructs and then organ modules, which is where we are, and finally a coupled human microphysiology uh, system. And in fact, uh, most of the systems people are working on in terms of scale range from either being a microhuman to a millihuman in terms of uh, scale. Well, uh, I won't dwell on this because this is old hat now, which is why we're here. Uh, can, should animals be surrogates uh, or humans? Well, we know the physiology of animals are distinct from human and the co concordance of target organ toxicity between lab laboratory animals and man is not optimal for most uh, organs. Uh, we know that it's low throughput. We know that it's expensive, and this, of course, has a major impact in environmental health testing where there's just too many compounds to test. Uh, these methods that uh, use the animals date to the 1930s. Uh, there's also societal pressures to decrease the use of uh, animal systems. And just to point something out, thalilamide is a, a drug historically that was deemed safe in animals, and we know uh, the problems. And of course, they didn't have the nice uh, 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 human uh, uh, female uh, systems that we heard about this morning. So obviously, for the, at least the last decade or so, people have been pushing to find alternatives to animal testing. Uh, in fact, there's been a nice evolution in the development of in vitro models. And today at 115, Franziska Boos uh, is going to uh, describe that in some detail, so I won't uh, cover it here. So one of the challenges we know are that humans are complex, heterogeneous systems. And uh, even if we take an individual uh, 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 from that a population, when we look at organs, the tissues, down to the single cells, the components of those cells, we find that uh, normal and abnormal functions occur through the interactions within uh, pathways. Uh, this just represents one of many pathways, and we already know now that there's great heterogeneity within pathways, even within a, a one individual. So one of the challenges we have in all of these systems isn't just the heterogeneity from person to person, based on a genetic background, but also heterogeneity and plasticity within individuals. 
So quantitative systems pharmacology, uh, which has been around and described for a, a few years now, is really the integration of classic pharmacology and the more uh, the newer field of systems biology to c create QSP. Uh, it really starts with uh, clinical samples conceptually. In this case, it could be experimental systems where you analyze a whole series of omics. You can in and then infer uh, pathways uh, and then design experimental models to explore uh, the activity. And of course, today uh, we're the most interested in the microphysiology systems, but other 3D models and even experimental organisms like zebrafish uh, are useful. With multiplexed measurements, uh, we can use machine learning. We can build into the analysis measurements of heterogeneity, which we think are important. We need to capture all this complex data in a database. And of course, in systems biology, uh, the rule is if you think you begin to understand the process, in this case, pathway activities, uh, then you ought to be able to computationally model it. And in the course of using QSP, this is a circle that what you learn from the first set of uh, experimentation, you can then use uh, the holes that you find in the computational models to develop new uh, measurements. So in the case of drug discovery, this is really flipping things in reverse. It's a heavy investment up front in sophisticated measurements rather than the back end. In environmental health, I think it's the same thing. You worry about the system more in the beginning of the process versus the end. So uh, our microphysiology system focuses the liver. Uh, I show the device. We also use a device made by uh, Nordis. We also have a second device uh, being engineered at the MGH, which I'll describe. Uh, the picture shows the device sitting on type, the top of a micro a tighter plate so you can see the scale. Uh, obviously the key is to have 3D organ constructs integrating flow between organ systems because that's the ultimate goal. Uh, we want to incorporate stem cells ultimately to evaluate the impact of human heterogeneity and I think uh, I'll just add to what's been said this morning if these platforms are going to be of general use and widespread, we have to turn the cells from a specialty uh, into something that you can acquire in a, a tube. Uh, an ultimate goal of all of these things is to be able to take complex data generated in those systems to, uh, to develop models for pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics, uh, to name two. So our goal was to build a human biomimetic microfluidic 3D liver sinusoid, a so-called liver acenus model, which is shown on the right, where we have a gradient of oxygen and pH from a high oxygenation side of the liver acenus to a low. So this is zone one, two, and three. And we have the organizational structure of hepatocytes uh, layered with endothelial cells, and particularly the involvement of stellate cells and Kupfer cells. So <clears throat> those are the four cell types that we used. We wanted to make sure that we could maintain a normal liver, liver functions, including metabolism, clearance, protein synthesis, urea detoxification, overall cell health and differentiation, and the milestones for the first phase of our program uh, was to have it functional over at least the 28-day period. Uh, we also wanted to provide clinically relevant mechanistic toxicity information uh, uh, via real-time uh, biosensors as well as microclinical analyzers, and to then ultimately be able to uh, generate predictive models from the many sources of uh, data. So this is just a summary of where we are now. I could put this at the end of the slide, uh, but I've put it at the beginning. Uh, we've reached uh, all of the goals of the first two years of the NCATS program. Um, I'd just like to point out a couple of things. Uh, we've been able to not only demonstrate the normal function of hepatocytes over this period, but could demonstrate with the presence of stellate cells under challenge uh, the ability to uh, produce uh, fibrosis in the models and immune-induced hepatotoxicity. 
Um, <clears throat> we've also implemented a whole panel of fluorescence-based biosensors. Uh, and at least in the present generation, we've delivered those biosensors via lentivirus uh, delivery, and so we can measure such things as mitochondrial calcium, uh, mitochondrial uh, ROS production, apoptosis, and by tagging some of the cells that are locomotory, like the uh, Kupfer cells, we can identify location and uh, activation. We've also completed the first phase of our microphysiology database, uh, which as I'll show you in a couple of minutes, we think is critical for not only capturing all the data that's being produced from one and then multiple organ systems, but then be able to do modeling uh, with that data. Uh, we're working on a couple of different uh, 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 disease systems like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, using the uh, microphysiology system as a niche for metastatic breast cancer and some infectious uh, diseases, and we've had some success so far. So this is the overview of the human microphysiology platform. Uh, we've been developing in parallel two different model systems. One we call the layered liver acenus model, shown on the upper left and then the liver self-assembly model. And the difference is that physically we layer the cells in the right structure. In the layered liver acenus model, the liver self-assembly model, we put the cells together in the right proportions and let them evolve and form their own structure, which has been uh, quite remarkable. We've started with uh, primary human hepatocytes as the, the main cell line. In the first phase, we used human cell lines for the other three cell types, endothelial cells, Kupfer cells, and stellate cells. Second phase, we're starting to identify uh, primary cells for those three cell types, and we've already started using uh, iPS-derived uh, hepatocytes as a starting point. So it's going to evolve. As I said, we think it's really going to be a powerful platform when we can use iPS cells throughout. Uh, we not, not only use the native cells, but we transduce a subpopulation of the cells with these lentiviral contained biosensors so that we have a real-time measurement. So in the device itself, we make uh, a, a number of biochemical measurements in the outflow of the, the media and also some metabolism readouts using uh, mass spec. On the lower left, we also use a high content analysis to look at uh, these biosensors in real time and over time. In the bottom middle, you can see one of this, what we call sentinel cell biosensors, which is uh, reporting uh, ROS production in mitochondria with a known drug to it that induces apoptosis. This is a cytochrome C release, which is the last stage, which is why you see a disappearance of the fluorescent signal from being highly intense, focused within the mitochondria, and then diffusing out and become, uh, becoming diluted in the cytoplasm. All of this complex data is then captured with our microphysiology database for further analysis. Uh, we can also uh, use these devices uh, with a variety, for a variety of disease. Uh, experimentation. The one example I'll show you today is using it as a, uh, a niche for metastatic breast cancer. Uh, this shows the self-assembly assembly liver model uh, where we've mixed the cells into the, uh, actually it's a Nordis device, a different one than, than uh, Jonathan described for the kidney. And the green islands you see there are the cords of hepatocytes and the endothelial cells, stellate cells, and Kupfer cells that are interacting uh, with it. Uh, this shows a kind of a cartoon of the development of the layered liver acenus model. Uh, the difference here is that one by one, we layer in the cells into the device. It has uh, two chambers, and you can see the dimensions. Uh, there's a bottom chamber that is separated from the upper chamber with a, a, a porous membrane. And uh, we then uh, can coat the bottom of, uh, or the top of the porous membrane with ECM and the bottom chamber with ECM. We then layer in through the port going to the lower chamber with hepatocytes. 
Uh, we then add a mixture of uh, stellate cells and a semi-fluid uh, uh, gel to layer on top of that. Then in the upper chamber, we add the endothelial cells, and finally on top of the endothelial cells, uh, we add the Kupfer cells. So all the dimensions in this layered structure are essentially what we find in the human liver acenus, including the dimensions of the, uh, the space of DIS. Uh, a critical aspect of all of this is regulating flow. Uh, it's been demonstrated in all the organ systems so far as when you have physiologically relevant flow, all of the physiological parameters are improved, whether it's biochemical production or other activities. Uh, we look at the human liver and you go through the calculations, it's about 500 microliters per milligram liver per minute in terms of uh, flow. In our MPS devices so far, we're studying a range of about 1 to 50. Uh, and uh, we're trying to understand the, the, uh, the pros and the cons of different amounts of uh, flow in the systems. Uh, a key aspect of uh, functionality within the liver is the bile canicular uh, dynamics. And on the left, uh, you can see, and we, we get the same thing in both the self-assembly model and the layered acenus model. Uh, when you add a fluorescent dye, uh, if uh, it can be normally pumped out, uh, you see the canicular networks form. And if you look at the uh, data on the bottom, you can see that over time uh, the fluorescence is pumped away. However, well, however, we know that triglitazone inhibits uh, bile efflux, and so you just get an increase in fluorescence uh, intensity over time until you start getting uh, a, a degradation uh, of the cells. So uh, we, uh, over 28 days, we can see that we after initially uh, plating the cells within the device and starting flow, uh, we get uh, lactate dehydrogenase flattening out so there's uh, no evidence of damage over the, uh, that period of time. And under flow, we get uh, physiologically relevant uh, production of uh, urea and albumin. So uh, normal hepatocyte function is uh, maintained. We can also look at the effects of drugs that are known to induce uh, activity. This is a, uh, a study using triglitazone as the antagonist uh, drug versus caffeine as a control. Uh, and we have kind of a 4x Cmax uh, example and then uh, four times uh, greater than that. I won't go through all the details, but you get the pr uh, predicted effects in re reduced uh, uh, albumin production, urea production, and increased in LDH uh, release and in induction of apoptosis. Uh, we've looked at, of course, uh, SIPS uh, activity. This is just showing one uh, where we've used testosterone and can demonstrate the clearance of testosterone in the system. Uh, we can do that uh, in the first week as well as the last week. And we can also identify the metabolite uh, that is formed uh, from uh, testosterone. Uh, so the SIP activities uh, appear to be maintained during the course uh, of the first month. Uh, this shows uh, a, on the left a bright field uh, image of the uh, uh, layered liver acenus model with the two layers. Uh, on the right is uh, a time lapse of the ROS uh, biosensor that's uh, targeted into the mitochondria. And uh, over a 24-hour period, when we dose it with 100 micromolar metadione, uh, we get a dramatic production in ROS as uh, predicted. Uh, one of the interesting things, uh, and I'm, I've been interested in heterogeneity and cellular responses for a long time, that uh, there is great heterogeneity on a cell-by-cell -cell basis uh, in terms of response to a uniform treatment with uh, uh, the drug, which is an interesting aside. Um, we also uh, can put the uh, metastatic breast cancer cells into the lower chamber of this device, so it's sitting down initially with uh, the hepatocytes, and I'll get to that in a minute. 
one of the things that we wanted to do is to show some activity based on the other cell types, the stellate cells and the Kupfer cells. And so when we uh, challenge these cells with things that it will induce fibrosis in vitro, like a bolus of methotrexate, uh, we find in the upper left a uh, number, uh, the, the, the stellate cells here are labeled yellow. By day 13, they've been uh, increased in number. On the bottom, and I apologize, we, we should have changed the color coding, uh, on the bottom at day 21, uh, we can see uh, the expression of collagen from these stellate cells in these linear arrays of collagen. So not only do the stellate cells reproduce in response to uh, a challenge, but they also will start forming fibers. So obviously fibrosis and a number of liver diseases is important. So we've also established an immune-mediated uh, hepatotoxicity uh, from, with the Kupfer cells that we've been using, uh, LPS will increase TNF-alpha. And then in an immune-mediated toxicity uh, assay where we actually measure uh, apoptosis, we can see if we combine trovofloxacin uh, with LPS, we get a very rapid and dramatic immune response. And trovofloxacin will also induce uh, uh, immune-induced a hepatotoxicity, but at a lower level and rate than uh, when combined with LPS. So in terms of kind of diseases, one of the things we were interested in understanding is metastatic niche. Uh, uh, and in fact, we know that women don't usually die from primary tumors, but it's the metastatic tumors. And the metastatic uh, tumors don't respond. Uh, optimally to drugs, and in fact, they can exhibit resistance, and then obviously at various periods of time post-treatment can re-emerge. So uh, we added a, 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 f a fluorescently labeled uh, uh, MDA MB231 cells with a, uh, a red fluorescent protein, so we could identify them in the mix. Uh, put them into the lower chamber of the layered liver acenus model. And what we found over a period of time was there were two subpopulations. Some of the cells uh, stayed down with the hepatocytes and became more rounded and non-motile and they didn't divide. Another subpopulation migrated up away from the hepatocytes and in fact uh, uh, divided and were highly motile. And that data is shown on the bottom right of uh, these two subpopulations. So now we're beginning to use this model to do drug testing. What is the responsiveness of these two different subpopulations within this uh, 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 model system? So uh, we generate a massive amount of data in using uh, not only our liver uh, microphysiology system, but especially when we start coupling these. So we've been developing the microphysiology database, and the goal is to be able to manage, consolidate, visualize, and model data. Uh, we also want to be able to readily access the richness of external database. Uh, there's PubChem, there's a, a, very, a variety of toxicology database. We want to be able to access that information from one source. Uh, we want to have a redistribution distributable and easily installable application using open source tools. Uh, we can, we're designing this to be run on the web, but it can also have locally run systems for partners that want to keep their information to themselves. Uh, and obviously, to be able to do this, we provide a public uh, API. Uh, the key here is to be able to do a variety of things. One. Uh, again, some of the public databases of compounds, we can go out and br browse compounds, bring into our database from external databases key information about molecules we're studying. We obviously want to be able to create data reports on the treatments of these models. Uh, we want to then be able to cluster the results, for example, of looking at a variety of compounds on the system, be able to do predictive modeling. Uh, we want to be able to import data from uh, a variety of sources. Uh, 
design the device layouts. We may want to vary parameters from one experiment to another when we want to be able to manage that. Uh, and then obviously be able to, to manage users and groups that are uh, using the database uh, for their systems. So this, in kind of a summary, we want to be able to design assays, process data, cluster data, and build models. Uh, we've implemented this for the liver, uh, but now in this next phase, uh, we're going to be putting together the liver and the kidney and the gut, as uh, Jonathan indicated. Uh, and uh, this is a repeat of the slide he showed. I just want to make one comment about this. And when we put the liver, the kidney, and the gut together, we're going to be missing things like hormones from uh, other organs. So uh, we've designed into this at the bottom what you can see is the missing organ microformulator <laughs> so that we can send in doses of hormones or other things that kind of partially, we hope, make up for the absence of all of the other organs. Uh, a cardiopulmonary assist system because we're going to be pumping through, in this case, three different organ systems. It's a big challenge. So I'll finish up by, and I won't read these off. You can see them and read them faster than I can state them. But there are still great uh, challenges that we need to address in the microphysiology systems program. Uh, I, for one, am extraordinarily excited about the potential but also there is the realization that there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, this is a huge undertaking and we're solving uh, problems uh, one by one. Uh, a couple of the key things will be ease of use. Uh, we can't have the need for biomedical engineers to, to run these systems. Uh, it has to be cost effective uh, because we want experimentalists both in universities as well as industry using them. Uh, uh, one of the things that we have to deal with is the major material used in the devices today is PDMS, which is known to bind uh, hydrophobic molecules. Uh, so we have to convert to uh, materials that don't bind hydrophobic molecules or improve the treatment of the PDS, PDMS systems. Um, anyway, I think uh, although there's a long list and more of challenges, what we've, the field's been able to do in a short number of years is, to me, quite impressive. So I'm uh, uh, very excited about our potential to meet these challenges. So with that, I'll acknowledge kind of the work we've been doing in quantitative systems pharmacology, the 3D biomimetic human liver model, uh, and now with the integration uh, of the, the gut, the uh, liver, and the kidney, uh, that team. So with that, I'll thank you and answer a question. Do we have a, a few minutes for questions, um, both for Lance and for other speakers before we, we go to lunch? So are there any questions on the liver team? Are the other speakers to come up, please? It's just you if there are any questions. <laughs> or just one. I have one question from the uh, webcast, which was uh, just a technical question. Um, they're asking what uh, extracellular matrix you use. So if you could answer over your mic, that'd be great. Sure, uh, great question, and I didn't go into that in, in, in great detail. In the first generation system, we're using uh, kind of some of the standard matrix material, including uh, rat tail collagens. Uh, but based on the lead uh, that we got from uh, Jonathan Himmelfarb and his work in a kidney extracellular matrix starting with decellularized uh, 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 kidneys, we've started doing the same in the liver and we think that will add yet another step as he's demonstrated in the kidney. Which I might add is one of the values of the collaborative that has been formed uh, within NCATS that we are feeding off of one another. Uh, some people have taken advantage of some of our biosensors. We're learning things from uh, other subgroups, so I think we're accelerating the developments because it is a collaborative. Uh, Helmut Zarbel uh, from Rutgers. I'm also a committee member. So my question has to do with using the induced stem cells versus primary cells. I mean, there's been some debate as to whether the sort of epigenome or, or, or the, or, you know, the, the status of the induced stem cells is not exactly 
uh, kosher. And since all of this is going to be dependent on it, I wonder if you could comment on that. Yes, uh, uh, great point. So um, I'll restate what I said before. I believe the real impact of this technology will by far be uh, 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 positive if we're able to use IPS-derived cells because then it becomes a reagent that's readily available and can be reproducible. The downside is that it's still evolving technology. We're not where we want to be yet. And as Kyle pointed out today, there's been great progress. But we're going to have to compare the results between primary hepatocytes and iPS-derived hepatocytes, as an example. And so this isn't something that's going to be done within the next six months. It's going to evolve over time. And it may or may not work the way we'd like it to work. Uh, Cheryl Walker, and I'm also a member of the committee, and I would like to follow up on that, but I would not phrase it quite in the same way Elma <laughs> did, um, because I think it's actually a really important point for thinking about next generation systems. So who is characterizing the epigenetic changes that are going on in the induced iPS cells versus the endogenous tissue cells themselves? Yeah, there's a number of groups around the, the country, including a liver group at the University of Pittsburgh that we're working with doing that kind of characterization and the d data is ongoing so and there you get enough cells from these systems to do chip seek and methyl seek and some of these other epigenetic profiling techniques at, at a low level at this point and that's one of the challenges any other questions well, i think we've had an opportunity to hear uh, a number of interesting systems this morning and, and we get to see how those systems can be this is an opportunity for us to think about these um, in the context of how we might use them in environmental health and in toxicity testing. Um, this afternoon's session, we're going to uh, get into some of those kinds of issues and have some uh, panel discussions with a number of our, our speakers. And so uh, you'll have an opportunity to jump in and uh, contribute to that discussion this afternoon. So let's break now. Um, we need to be back here by about 1.15 to 1.20 so that we can get started with the uh, afternoon session. We're WebExing in our first speaker this afternoon. <laughs>